All right, well, I guess we'll just go ahead and start then. Uh, today is Wednesday, March 22nd, 2017. My name is Jose Centeno Melendez, and I am with Texas State House Representative Roberto Alonso at the University of Texas at Austin in Austin, Texas. This interview is being recorded for the Voices Oral History Project, a research mm. unit housed within the University of Texas at Austin's School of Journalism in collaboration with UT Libraries. Thank you, Mr. Alonso, for taking the time to join us today. Sure. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and jump right into this conversation on the Texas Border Initiative. Uh, by the time you were first elected into office, mm. the Texas Border Initiative was already taking shape. Um, how familiar were you with this initiative when you got elected? Uh, had you been following the LULAC versus Richards class action lawsuit mm. that was uh, filed by Amada? Not at all. Uh, I first found out about it when I got to be in, in the legislature in 93, but uh, I'm, I'm from the border. I'm from Crystal City, Texas. I'm very familiar with the history, the background, uh, the politics. I was a farm worker in the area as well as traveling all over the country. Uh, so I was very familiar with uh, the needs. Uh, but I also was familiar with successes. In my hometown, we had Mexican-American studies. We had uh, Mexican-American uh, principals, uh, folks that were be getting masters, folks that were getting doctors, folks that were going on to college. I mean, the, the, we had a, a health clinic, one of the only health clinics in that border area. I mean, tons of funding for housing and the list of all the needs. Uh, so when I heard about it, uh, of course, I'm for it. But more important, I, I grew up where our political activity got results. And even though there was results in Crystal City, I didn't see it in the rest of the border region. So it's very, you know, very fort, very, yeah. In fact, I, in my opinion, I wanted even more. Wow. Um, so I imagine that the processes to make social change in Crystal City would be different on the ground right now. You're working within the legislator. Mm -hmm. um, so can you explain how the Texas legislator determines the amount of funds to allocate for institutions of higher learning? What does that process look like? Sure. Uh, so we have a budget, and within that budget, we have different needs. We have transportation, public education, uh, health care, as well as higher education. So through the years, what's happening, there's been less funding coming from Austin into the, le into the universities. As a result, you've seen uh, increase in tuition and different crises of creative ways to get funding. And uh, in another way, loss of funding as well, because the, the state law says that all veterans have a right to an education at university, and that's money that we don't allocate automatically, but the university has to pay for it. So the money comes, some, some of the money comes from the legislature. But the way I look at money is uh, there's always money, it's just who gets the money. Uh, for example, I worked on scholarships and other type of legislation where I've been able to get it, as well as other legislators, depending on where the pendulum swings or the leadership swing, that's where the money goes. For example, from 93 to 2003, we had a, a, a speaker from West Texas. So you saw, saw a lot of the money go through the rural towns of that part of the world. Uh, the, the last few years we had people in the, in the urban areas. Specifically uh, this year, there was a choice between uh, a, a state rep from um, San Angelo and a state rep from Houston. Uh, the, the fellow from Houston got chosen, and I think it's a positive move because you have an understanding from the urban area. But on the other hand, in this last session, there was also a very positive move for the border uh, initiative effort. And by that, I mean the vice chair, which is a very powerful position of the finance in the Senate, is uh, Juan Chuino Josa from the Valley. And the vice chair of the House is uh, Oscar Longoria, also from the Valley, who are very familiar with border initiatives. So uh, if we do a plan, I say we, because it's a state effort and I fully support it as well. Uh, there could be some, at this moment, positive progress in that effort as well. So it sounds like representation really does matter, right? Especially in the legislature. It, it does, and, and that's why uh, uh, I'm very supportive of the Voting Rights Act and having uh, uh, Chicanos, Latinos in the legislature because uh, people have that perspective, that understanding, and not only understanding and perspective, but the way I like to put it, uh, you, be, you, can, you, be, you can be obligated to do something or you can want to do something. We can pass laws 
Uh, but if you don't want to implement them, you know, we don't get it done. There's tons of laws in the, on, on paper, but if folks don't want to do it, then it doesn't get done. So you put people that understand you, you, there's uh, more likelihood it's going to happen. Yes, it does matter who sits at the table. So with that in mind, what would you say was the state of the Texas Border Initiative when you started your first term as an elected official? It was awful. Uh, w let me tell you how awful it was. And I still remember the statistics. Uh, when I got there in 93, uh, in one third of the state, one third of the population, which included San Antonio, Corpus, Kings of the Valley, and all along the border to El Paso, there was only two doctoral programs in that region of the state. And it gets back to the want. Folks didn't want to, they didn't have people pursuing it. So when there was a lawsuit by Maldiv regarding the, the uh, border initiative, even though it lost, in 93, we injected $150 million into the region. And through the years, there's been increments. Uh, so you've seen a, a big progress as a result of that effort, where we now have tens of dozens of doctoral programs and masters. And through the years, we picked up a medical school in the Valley of Medical School in, in uh, 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 El Paso. There's other kinds of other health initiatives in the area from degrees and so forth. So it's positive, but to me, I think the next step is not that we do increments, but that we full a full-fledged plan, kind of like similar to as we talk about through the years, the Marshall Plan after um, World War II. Uh, because what I've seen, it's not that you just think about it, uh, you gotta have a plan, and then you ha gotta have continuation, it's like this. Uh, I remember being in a legislative panel and the presenter said, when you build a bridge, let's say it costs a billion, it really doesn't cost a billion, it costs three billion because once you build it, you gotta maintain it. So in this effort, now looking back to 93, you know, my thought with the knowledge that I had at the time was, well, let's just start it. Well, you'll see, historically, there can be a lot of startups and there's no continuation because there's no plan for the continuation. I, in a cute way, say it, it's kinda like getting married. You know, you get married, but that's not the big deal. The big deal is the continuation of what goes in, involved, the, the house, the purse, the shoes, the neighborhood, uh, the you know schools for the kids, the college for the kids, uh, and then the pension at the end. It's the full, you know, concept. Uh, but you can't know these things through till you get knowledge. I look back when I grew up in Crystal City as a farm worker, and then going on to college and UT and law school and state rep. You know when you don't have that knowledge of the two part, the startup and then the continuation, you have no idea what, is, what it's about. But now uh, that I've been in the process for a while, and especially being, a, I'm the vice chair of pensions, that has helped me even get a better understanding about when you start something, you gotta have continuation. So the plan is not just the start, but is the continuation as well. Has that process uh, to continue funding been difficult at all? It always is difficult, uh, but it, you know, it, it, to me, as I uh, commented earlier, it's always money. It's just who gets the money. Uh, we, in the time that I've been in the legislature, the last you know 14 years since 2003, uh, we've been down. For example, in 2003, 11 billion dollars. In 2011, we were down 27 billion. This year, we're down about two or three billion. Uh, but there's always ways of getting it done. It's just who, who, whose ax gets gored, whose ox gets gored. Uh, but that's why it comes back to having people, as you commented earlier at the table, that can also have an input into the priorities. So to me, looking back, even when we were down, we were, uh, there was always a possibility and there's always funding for it. And, uh, and including in that knowledge is this, it's not that we have money, it's also not give up the money. For example, two years ago, we gave up $10 billion in tax breaks, and now we're needing $2 billion. So we gotta be careful when we give up money. Uh, the other part that's important is uh, wh who can we tax and when can we tax. For example, there was a bill that passed out the last couple of days that says in the Senate that you can you know, limit how much tax you collect. Well, at the local level, if you do that, then how are you gonna get the money to run the programs that you need? And it reminds me of a pastor, Roberto Gomez, from a church in my area that says, 
give unto God what is God and Caesar what is Caesar. Well, Caesar is the government, and the government needs taxes, needs money to run program. And what does that have to do with higher ed at the local level? Well, if the state doesn't give money, but we at the local level want to do initiatives, then we can tax locally to do it. For example, uh, last spring, uh, there was a vote at the school board to spend $100 million in Dallas on pre-K. Similar concepts like that can be used for higher ed. If uh, the local folks with the city, county, you know, uh, whoever in the area has that opportunity. Because you always, I don't care what people say, you don't need money, of course you need money. And especially with the, it's in Texas, where the increase of population and the increase of cost, you're always gonna have to have money. And it, you know, during the duration, you're gonna have to increase what you collect to be able to fulfill all your needs. Have you received any pushback? Has anyone said, you know what, there's enough money for all these initiatives? No, there, there's always pushback. For example, I did a presentation of the minimum wage increase to $15 on Monday, and uh, uh, the, one of the state reps said, well, you know, how is it going to hurt small businesses? You know, similar to what you're commenting. There's always going to be a, a response, but the, the goal here is not only that there's pushback, but that you have people of like minds making decisions. And that's where it comes down to have people of like minds being at the table. So here's an example of people having like minds. Uh, in 1993, you um, wrote a House bill that ended up being signed into law. Mm -hmm. um, speaking specifically House Bill 1261. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, what that was, uh, it, it followed a concept of I have a dream about allowing people to fulfill their dreams to go to college. So it was an initiative that was signed into law through the coordinating board to encourage uh, partnerships to uh, have that kind of concept. So yeah, that in fact, that one was signed into law with a picture and all that kind of stuff with uh, uh, Governor Ann Richard. So yeah, and, and that's an example of that where we have continuation. Uh, the people through the years didn't see it as a good need, so they got rid of it. But even though they got rid of that, there was other opportunities. I can tell you, for example, you know, being a like minds, uh, since uh, 2003, I created a scholarship for bilingual education that started 150,000 since 2003 to two years ago. And last year, I was able to increase it to a million a year, to not only focus on one university through seven universities, and in that 12 year period, we're able to get like 229 uh, new bilingual ed bilingual teachers and about 700 scholarships in a 12 year period. So God willing, within this next, this past two years, we picked up another 229 teachers and uh, 700 more scholarships, which, you know, it's a big chunk. Uh, so it's a matter of, you know, if one door closes, you open up another one, but you gotta know where the doors are. So how has the Texas Border Initiative evolved over time? And how have your colleagues reacted to the growth of South Texas universities? Uh, it has evolved positively. Uh, and and it's, it takes, it, there's two parts to the implementation. One is us passing legislation to get it done. The other part is having the infrastructure, people that feel the same way along the border to do that. And I think uh, besides the medical universe, the medical schools along the border, one of the big things that happened in the Valley was to create a super university, which is UTRGV by combi combining UT Brown, so UT Pan Am into a major university to have a more influx of funding. Uh, just like the other major universities like UT Austin and A&M get funding a certain way, this will allow opportunities for that and, and have more opportunities because it's a bigger university to compete uh, and get in the big chunks of money. Cool. Uh, so you made history by not only being the first Latino elected into the student uh, body government here at UT, mm -hmm. but you were also the first Latino uh, elected in North Texas, correct, as a uh, representative? That's correct. So how have these experiences shaped you, and what has been your role as one of the few Latino voices in these really important institutional spaces? Well, uh, in fact, uh, here's the article in uh, March of 1978 uh, in the Daily Text, and I went and looked for it because I like to pass it out because people a lot, you know, ask me, is it true? And like anything, if you can't touch it, it's like it didn't happen. So here's the proof. 
Uh, and as you see, uh, it was 78. That was in the height of the Chicano movement. You know, I still consider myself a Chicano because of my history and background. So wh what does it mean? Uh, I grew up in Crystal City in the peak of the Chicano movement where we were taught that you are proud of who you are. Your background is indigenous and it's also Spaniard. So uh, in fact, we have like 11 kids from my mom and dad. Half of us were dye complected Half of us were dark complected. If you see my boys got full beard, and of course, I can't even grow a mustache. But it's just, you know, the indigenous background. But getting back to like doing it, um, when I got here to UT, we had tons of kids, just like all the kids that come here are smart. Uh, and we all compete. Uh, and the question was to run. And the question was who? And there was tons of people. There was probably like 10, nine people running. and. What we did here was create an infrastructure of politics. We had a ton of Chicano organizations. We had Chicano pre-law, we had Chicano business, we had Chicano health, we had a la amistad, we had a, a Chicano business. I mean, there was like 30 you know, Chicano organizations. Uh, so I remember as I was campaigning, I had five campaign, 10 campaign managers, five Chicanos, five Chicanos. They were all super smart, super great. There are now DAs and county attorneys and uh, one is, is a president of Louisiana, uh, AT&T, others are assistant attorney generals, uh, school board members, I mean, just great leaders. Uh, in fact, uh, the person who was in charge of communications, in fact, a graduate uh, of this school, uh, created the name of the organization of my campaign, which was CERA, Students to Elect Roberto Alonso, you know, to be and our campaign slogan was, Si se puede, it can be done. Uh, so anyways, I was campaigning, and uh, politically what I did was uh, work the infrastructures from my constituency to get it going was all the Chicano groups. Like, that's, when you run for office, you go to your core. So that was the big chunk. In fact, there was another lady, Chicana running, Lena Guerrero, and she went the other route. She went to the, the Democrats and thinking they will endorse her and come to the Chicanos, right, have her victory. And they said, no, we already have her candidate. His name's Roberto Alonso. So she gave up and endorsed me. But getting back to the, the, my, my upbringing, where you feel proud of yourself, so to me, the sky's the limit. So part of uh, in getting educated and knowing who you are is being proud of yourself. So that creates an opportunity. Then you got to use your skills to make sure it happens. So with the, the pride and the background and the education and then the skills of, of how to do politics, you take it to the next level. And that was similarly in uh, both here at UT, and I've been president of tons of organizations. Uh, uh, and uh, when I got to Dallas, the first thing I did was ask, uh, so when do we go door to door? And the Chicano leadership of Dallas said, we don't do that, we do press conferences. I go, so how are you gonna get elected if you don't have votes? There was no response, so I helped create a group called the Mexican American Democrats that that's already existed in Dallas, but they didn't do the grassroots work. When I got when I got there to Dallas, the voter registration in my area was 15% Mexican American. The turnout was two Chicanos per precinct. Now the registration is 65%, you know, and the turnout is like two to 600 per precinct. So. You know, the skills, the background, the initiative, the pride that you all combine it, you know, you get it done. Do you find yourself ever, ever using these personal anecdotes or looking back at these personal experiences as a means to push, you know, legislation for a higher education? Do you share these anecdotes with your colleagues? Sure, sure. And, and you share the anecdotes, but it's also like a give and take. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was, uh, at, I'm on the higher ed committee, been there you know, over nine years, and uh, I remember I wanted something done for Texas Southern University, and the chairman of the committee wanted something done for his effort. I said, I'll support you if you support me. See, I, I make you happy, you make me happy. So it's the anecdotes, but it's also the skills of how to work the process. Because uh, I know everybody has priorities, and I respect that, for example, when it comes to the border initiative. I support the guys on the border, you know, members of the House and Senate in that area. And because I know, but the other part, because I'm selfish, because I say, 
You know, I'll help you if you help me in North Texas. What does that mean? Our population of Hispanics in North Texas is two, two million. So we have a lot of uh, uh, things that are there, universities and medical schools and law schools and so forth. Uh, but the next part is not that it's there, that it be open to our folks so they can go in the door and get educated and prepared. So it's, it's a two-way process. One, I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do and I grew up there. And, but the other part is if we can work together, you can help me in my part of the world. And, and there's been many occasions, whether it's uh, search and rescue task forces, whether it's uh, uh, co scholarships, whether it's a Center for Mexican American Studies at UT Arlington, I have plenty of support from, from the South. That's really good to hear. Um, looking back, in what ways would you say that the Texas Border Initiative shifted or changed access to higher education for Mexican American Latino youth in South Texas? Well, it, it created more opportunities. I think not that they went to school, but that they got masters and doctorates. Uh, and, and it's something that takes a while to get, for example, when I started this scholarship by Bilingual Ed, I concentrated only on bachelor's degrees, but I remember speaking to a superintendent that said, we need principals and, and, and superintendents as well. So I encouraged the distribution that we add, both masters and, 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 and doctorates. And even now, uh, one of the things that I'm interested in doing, knowing th that concept is, how come we don't have a lot more Latino professors in the universities? Well, if you don't create a pipeline, if you don't have the scholarships, if you don't have the programs, so that's, that's one of my goals, to make sure that we have funding and scholarships and, and, and initiatives to not only work at the, at the beginning level, but at the core level as well. So when the question comes up, are there enough qualified doctor folks out there, there'll be time to choose from. Are there any special needs that uh, representatives are talking about in relation to these master's PhD programs in South Texas? Mm, I think it, it, it would be going back to how we started, that we create a plan of how we not only think about it, but how to implement it. And then the question comes back to the funding. And I keep up with the funding as well. For example, there's one of the reps that I work with. He's always finding new money. No, nobody even thinks about it. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have six million billion dollars in an account that doesn't get invested. Well, that six billion can get you a hundred to two hundred million just from investments. So the question comes up, you know, where's the money come from? There it is. Yeah, there's definitely money out there then. There is for money. all these initiatives. Yeah. Um, So what have these conversations looked like with your colleagues? And some, you're, you're saying that it's good that there was an initiative that took place, right? Um, and it's one that was obviously very necessary for uh, colleges and universities in South Texas. Uh, but what have the conversations been like with your colleagues with regards to maintaining that momentum of keeping funding flowing? Yeah, it's been uh, not as, you know, uh, productive or, or moving, uh, but I still encourage moving the ball. And as I mentioned in my comments earlier, we have a good opportunity that we have two vice chairs of the Appropriations Committee in Finance right now. So now what I tell people in general when they're thinking of running for office, it's not that you run, it's not that you win, it's what are you gonna do? Right now for the border initiative, we have a good opportunity to move this ball because they're the folks that are designing the plan for the whole state. So as part of uh, the design, there can be a cachito for the border initiative. Sounds good. And I think we've reached our, uh, if we have time, if sure. you don't mind. I have a couple of questions over here for my colleagues. Uh, could you speak to your experience as a farm worker and how that shaped your approach to policy? Uh, it did, it did. So uh, briefly, uh, I'll tell you historically how I came to be and how this farm worker uh, concept evolved. So in the history of the United States, uh, in 1910, there was 150,000 Mexicans throughout the United States. 1911, a million 150,000. 
1912, 2,150,000. Why? Because in Mexico, like happens in other countries, right? Uh, there was a civil war called the Mexican Revolution. And you either had to be for Vieira or Carranza, and if you didn't answer right, they would kill you, literally. So part of that history is my history, why? My, my grandpa, Emeterio Luz Alonso from Coahuila, on the other side of Eagle Pass, during the 20s, came into the United States. They went all the way to Toledo, Ohio. Why? To go work in the f tomato fields of Toledo. While they were there, they had several babies. One of them was my dad, Emeterio Alonso Jr. And then the 30s came, he was born in 1931. The 30s came in uh, the Depression. So this, how, how do we fix this problem of the Depression? We'll send 500,000 Mexicans back to Mexico. Part of those Mexicans was my dad and my grandpa and grandma and my aunts and uncles. And my aunt Rosa says that, uh, may she rest in peace, she passed also, uh, that my grandma would cry because they were taking these kids. They were not Mexican kids to Mexico. So my, my aunts and uncles and my dad grew up in Coahuila and as teenagers, they got restless, like happens a lot from what I hear. Uh, and they came into Texas and hid in the farms. This is a true story, my, grand, my aunt said. And one day if they were hiding, uh, they started talking about where were you born, you know. They said, where are you from, you know, Via Unión Coahuila? Uh, which way did you come from, you know, from Mexico, this way and that way across the Rio Grande River? And then they said, where were you born? And they said, Toledo, Ohio. Well, you're not a Mexican. What do you mean? You're not. So they asked for their birth certificate. It came. And there it showed. Emeterio Alonso Jr., son of, you know, Emeterio Alonso Sr. and Luz, you know, Munoz. Uh, so that Toledo concept and farm workers, my mom and dad got married. We started the cycle like in the 50, 1950 with my mom and dad. My, my brother Ramon was born in, in, uh, in Crystal City. Gerardo was born in uh, uh, San Antonio. Luisa was born in San Antonio. Uh, they got together and we moved to uh, Toledo in 19, after I was born in 56 and we moved to Toledo, lived there about three, four years. My brother Ruben was born. Again, going back to Toledo, working in the fields of, uh, for tomato. And then uh, we came back and followed the cycle. The cycle meaning you live here during uh, winter and early spring and then we would live in Texas six months and then go up north to the northern state six months. And in, in my upbringing through my 17th year or 16th year, we worked in places like Colorado, Oregon, Idaho, uh, Wyoming, Montana, uh, North Dakota, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, Indiana and Ohio and New Jersey. And of the 11 kids, about half of them were born up in uh, like five were born in like Minnesota, Wisconsin, Toledo, Ohio, and the other half uh, were born here. So how did it impact? Uh, 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 we would have conversations. Do you want to keep on working in the fields or do you want to make your life better? Uh, so that was the encouragement, you know, part. And then, you know, probably about 11 years ago, I heard about Cesar Chavez fighting for our rights as farm workers. So here we had a person that looked like me knew my experience and talked about being positive and that that encouragement kept it going and, and that that idea of making a better life for farm workers which was my family uh, became a part of me forever uh, and for example as I mentioned my slogan when I was running for student body president was si se puede it can be done and uh, now every time there's a Cesar Chavez birthday I do the resolution commemorating his birthday as well. So it had a big impact, yes. Uh, wow. So do you feel like that big impact, having this background, being a farm worker, uh, becoming, going through this moment of consciousness, mm -hmm. right, as from a young age, um, how does that in turn affect or influence your position on the border initiative? Well, let me tell you, not only the background, but of course you got to connect it to another part to make it happen. And, and by that I mean this. One of the sayings or phrases I always use uh, from the song El Rey, como dijo un arriero, no hay que llegar primero, hay que saber llegar. So the translation, because I had to look it up, right, is it's not whether you get, it's the wagon train driver says, it's not whether you get there first, is knowing how to get there. 
So first the consciousness, but then you got to connect or, you know, uh, get yourself with people that know how things are done to, to teach you and then to guide you and help you and have answers. So uh, before me, there were other leaders like Cesar Chavez and then persons that, that I specifically talked to, like I had a question like, this is happening, what is going to happen next? And what I've learned through the years, whatever we're doing, regardless of what it is, it's already happened before. But you got to talk to people that know of it, have gone through it to make sure it happens. So uh, using that consciousness, the skills, and then being uh, in the area, of course, it helps uh, the, what we're try talking about, which is the border initiative. So with that line of thought, would you talk, can you talk a little bit about like, what difference it would make to have Latino professors? It makes a lot, you know, I can tell you one of the things I always remember when I would see a movie, I would always look at the names of the, the, the who gets the credit. And whenever I see a Spanish surname, I mean, it makes you happy. Uh, when you see somebody that, that uh, a student see a Chicano professor, Latino, not only are they listening and learning, but they're imagining themselves that it can be done. Because one of the things I say, uh, if you're a king or queen, you're always going to be king or queen. If you're rich, you're always going to be rich. But if you grow up working, you got to be able to, like the wagon train driver says, is knowing how to get there. And by seeing professors, it's a very positive. And I'm sure there's tons of you know studies that that show that you see yourself in their place, which means that you can be that person as well. And just one last question. Sure. Uh, when did you become aware of discrepancies in higher education? Was it when I'm you sorry, were when, when become aware? Of when did you become aware of discrepancies in higher education? More clearly when I came to the university. More clearly. Uh, I saw a little bit going through college and, and uh, 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 law school. And, and I was in, very much involved at student politics, you know, work study. I was a work study student for uh, uh, Professor Américo Paredes and you know, a whole bunch of the gods in, in the Chicano studies effort and lawyers and Maldiv and South of Water Street. I mean, I know all that. But when you get here, you, you're able to get more information about what's going on. I'll give you like one little example. So when I got here, I wanted to be in higher ed uh, and I didn't get it. So I asked the chair of the Mexican American uh, Legislative Caucus to create a position for me within the Mexican American Caucus to create a higher education committee and make me chairman. And he did. The, the, the important part of that is because I had this title, the coordinating board would give me information. And one of those examples was when they decided to create a medical school in the Valley, one of the first persons they told was me because of creating a mechanism of getting the information. And you don't know that till you get to be in places where that happens because they're all that everything is there, everything. But if you don't have it and know how to work with it, you can't do anything with it. Well, thank you so much for your You're time. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. And yes, sir.